Good morning, everyone. Welcome to VSPG. Today we're hearing, well, good morning, but you know, everybody's everywhere. So uh, hello. Um, welcome, and we're going to be hearing from Professor or Dr. Fred Boyer today, exploring alternative global stratigraphic correlations across the Ediacaran Cambrian transition. Next week, we hear from uh, Jim Schiffbauer from the University of Missouri. Uh, this talk is titled Tubes and On Tubes and Taphonomy from the Terminal Ediacaran of Southwest North America. So join for that. And then the following week, we had uh, Peter Crockford signed up from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, but Peter Crockford has, um, uh, due to some travel, he won't be able to present. So we're going to find somebody else for the following week. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Fred for us. Okay. So Dr. Fred Boyer is a paleontologist and sedimentary geochemist with a focus on reconstructing paleoenvironmental conditions in the Proterozoic, particularly related to the rise of metazone life. He uses geochemical proxies, including carbon isotope composition, ion speciation, and phosphorus speciation to better model past redox settings and nutrient cycling. Fred received his PhD from the University of Edinburgh, working with Professor Rachel Wood on his thesis titled, Triggering the Cambrian Explosion, Carbon Cycle Reorganization and the Rise of Metazoans. After his PhD, he spent some time at the British Geologic Survey learning chemical abrasion, isotope dilution TIMS with Dan Condone, and then at the Nanjing University of Geology and Paleontology at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, where he started on work he's going to be presenting today. His first postdoc was at Leeds with Dr. Ben Mill, working on the proter Mesoproterozoic of the North China Craton and getting involved in some work on non-glacial cryogenian strata. And he currently positioned in his second postdoc with Professor Rachel Wood at the University of Edinburgh, again, studying the Ediacaran Cambrian stratigraphic record. So Fred, it's been really great to have, uh, it's really great to have you on and um, really excited to hear from you. So please go ahead and take it away. Cool, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, I thought I'd choose something quite controversial for today's topic, um, mainly associated with the EDF and Cameron transition. And I'm just trying to uh, pull together a lot of different records from across the world and, and fit them into a geochemical or into an age model, a chemostratigraphic age model. <clears throat> so in the background of this photograph, I've got a, a, a photograph of New Chalak Valley, which is a section in Southeast Siberia, which I'll come back to at the end of the talk, but is a relatively important area for uh, calibrating um, the fossil record across the Ediac and Cameroon boundary. Um, so before I get going, I'd like to just acknowledge a few people. Um, so the work that I'm going to present, and as Alex mentioned, is, is work that I started really during the end of my PhD um, and just after the end of my PhD. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's work that I started doing at the BGS with Dan Condon. And I met, uh, whilst I was at BGS, I met Xuan Yang, who was there as a postdoc at the time um, in the top central photograph. Um, and whilst I was there, I started to work on um, an integrated uh, radiometric archive and trying to pin together carbon isotope data um, across the Ediacaran um, with Shuan and Dan and others. Um, and then at the end of my PhD, I uh, went on an internship for two months um, at the Nanjing Institute of Geology and Paleontology, working with and hosted by uh, Marianne Zhu, where he put me to task with uh, a lot of carbon isotope data that were unpublished from a field trip that he and Rachel and others went on and with, with Andre Dravlev. Uh, to the southeast of the Siberian platform back in 2015. And whilst I was there, uh, coincidentally, Andrej Ravler was also there. So I got started to work on um, a composite of the Siberian platform, uh, late Ediac and early Cambrian, which I'll show in the second half of this talk. And all, all of these people on the, on the slide were involved in some um, way or other with, um, the, with, with the joint NERC NSF, NSFC a grant called BETR, or Bias for Evolution, Transition and Resilience, which was put together by Graham Shields and others. And my whole um, time at, uh, at, the, at NIGPAS, Nanjing Institute of Geology and Paleontology, was facilitated really by Graham and, and Inju. 
So thanks go to everyone on this slide. <clears throat> Before I get into the nitty gritty, I thought I'd just show, I don't know if you can see this, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I thought I'd just show a collage of some lovely Ediacaran fossils, body fossils. So um, just, I think everyone in the, in the talk really knows this, but I thought I'd just show the photographs anyway. Um, the Ediacaran assemblages or the soft bodied organisms and the, and the skeletal organisms that um, occupy the Ediacaran fossil record can be mainly broken up or subdivided into three broadly successive but slightly overlapping temporal um, assemblage biozones constituting the Avalon, White Sea and Nama assemblages. Um, this is post Gaskia's um, Ediacaran, so starting at around 580 million years ago and up to the pre Cambrian Cambrian boundary. And, um, uh, the Nama assemblage, and I'll just focus on, because my talk is focusing on the, uh, the end Ediacaran, early Cambrian, um, the Nama assemblage hosts the first appearance of skeletal organisms, including Namacolathus, which is at the top right-hand corner of the slide, and also tubular skeletal fossils like Claudina. Um, and the Nama assemblages are also um, occupied by a number of uh, non-skeletal uh, tubular forms and skeletal tubular forms, and they are really important. And actually, I'm, I was interested to hear that Jim is giving a talk next week on exactly that, so it should actually follow on quite nicely. Um, and I wonder whether he'll have anything to um, say against some things that I'm going to say today. So we'll see what he um, what he says. But basically, the um, the majority of the Ediacaran uh, biota, uh, their phylogenetic affinities are, are really uncertain. Some of them are more certain than others. So in the bottom right-hand corner, we've got this fossil um, recently reported by Frankie Dunn and others, um, Aurora Lumina, which may constitute uh, um, a crown, crown group Cnidarian. Um, and there are several other organisms in the soft body fossil record and the skeletal fossil record throughout the late Ediacaran that also probably stem um, an animals um, and, uh, and some have uh, more secure phylogenetic affinity than others. Um, and then in the, in the latest Ediacaran with these tubular forms, uh, there are differences in opinion on exactly what these are, but they're probably stem metazones of some sort. Now, the, the lower Cambrian fossil record, and I'm specifically focusing on the pre-trilobitic trilobitic lower Cambrian, um, hosts a whole, a whole host of, um, of various uh, small skeletal fossils, including some um, uh, sponges, and top left-hand corner, you've got these sponge spicules, some mollusks, including this one, Alganella, in the middle here, um, and other things like tomatiids, these Caminoan tomatiids, and, uh, and some other small sponges, the Archaeocyathes sponges, Chancelloriids, and other things that can be more confidently um, allied with, um, with the known uh, crown group record of, of animals. But then in, in the, at the very bottom of the Cambrian, or the oldest Cambrian record, we've got these tubular forms. In the bottom left-hand corner, you've got these anabaritids, and also um, some simple, very simple, uh, smooth-walled tubular fossils called Cambrian tubulus in the um, bottom left-hand corner, which have been um, have been applied with um, morphologically simplest anabaritids, although their, their actual position with respect to the um, potential transitional fossil assemblage across the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary is still up for debate, and exactly how old they are is also up for debate. So, what does the record look like across the uh, this interval? Well, uh, historically, this um, these two assemb this, these two um, fossil assemblages have been looked at in, in, in isolation, really. The Cambrian fossil record um, of, of people who look mainly at small skeletal fossils, they're focused in on the phylogenetic affinities of those um, skeletal fossils. And people who look at the soft body fossil and skeletal fossil record of the Ediacaran look at them in also in isolation. But um, it might be the roots of the Cambrian explosion are a lot older than the basal Cambrian, so they extend into the Ediacaran. And so th this is one um, example of a uh, hypothesis um, where we have these successive nested transitional radiations throughout this whole interval from the Gaskia's glaciation onwards up through into the Paleozoic. And each one of these successive transitional uh, radiations uh, was punctuated by intervals of, of, um, of extinction, most likely. So how well do we actually know and how well can we calibrate these fossils in time? Because this is a temporal record. So um, that's what I'd look, like to look at today and um, focusing in on exactly how we would do that. So I always use this analogy of a rock climber. 
when I'm talking about age model construction, because it really simplifies the whole issue. Maybe oversimplifies, but I'll just do it anyway. So we need four basic things to construct an age model. And the first two are, are related in the fact that they're it's lithostratigraphy and associated paleontology. So in this analogy, lithostratigraphy is literally the rock that this rock climber is climbing up. And the rock climber has, herself or themselves um, are, uh, are the paleontology, essentially the fossil occurrences within the record. So we need lithostratigraphic correlations in, uh, in regional correlations and robust and pre preferably within a sequence stratigraphic framework. We need uh, chemostratigraphy, the uh, highest resolution possible chemostratigraphy of, of hopefully tracking seawater composition, or at least, but we need to be mindful of local effects of restriction and, and diagenesis. And we need to anchor all of this within absolute time by radiometric ages. So radiometric ages from renum osmium in uh, organic, organic rich mud rocks or um, high precision radiometric ages from zircon uranium lead dating of ash beds. Um, so interbedded ash beds within a section. And if you have all of these things within one section, that section becomes extremely important and useful for ca calibration of um, regional and global um, chemostrophy and fossil occurrence information. So without um, these things, we're left, or with a, if we have a section that only has one or two of these things, um, we, we need to rely on, uh, the, for example, the chemostratigraphic record or the radiometric record to pin our bias GV in time. And this becomes more and more important the further back in time you go. So the, for the, for the Neoproterozoic, where the biostratigraphic um, assemblage zonation is quite loose, um, we really rely upon the, the global and um, uh, record of chemostratigraphy calibrated by radiometric ages to inform exactly when these fossils are occurring. A really nice example of this um, was presented by um, Adam Malouf and others in 2010. And this is a, has been a great inspiration for my work, actually, um, trying to put together these age models. And their record, they, um, for their record, they used um, a high resolution carbon isotope data set from the lower Cambrian of Morocco. And the, in the top panel here, those data are in gray. And the, the utility of that record was, uh, was, it was very, very useful because we, we have um, from that record, we've got, um, uh, we know exactly what the trends are in the carbon isotope curve throughout the um, the Fortunian stage two and stage three, and right up into the um, in, into stage four, actually from from Morocco. Um, but the unfortunately, the Moroccan record suffers from the fact that it doesn't have uh, very good or in places is completely barren with respect to small shelly fossils. So in order to constrain the small shelly fossils, um, Adam Malouf and others, they, um, they pinned together the carbon isotope records from other areas to the composite um, uh, stratigraphic column from Morocco to come up with, on the bottom here, you have this, um, this biostratigraphic record uh, from four different composite successions, including those in, in, um, in Morocco, Siberia, Mongolia, and South China. Um, one thing, there are a few things that have changed since this um, publication, and one of them is uncertainty in the actual age of the base, which is what this, this here is the basal Cambrian negative carbon isotope excursion. And I'll be referring over and over again to this because it's important for the boundary itself and the position of fossils relative to the base is important, not only for calibration of those fossils, but also for inferring um, a driver or, um, or the presence or absence of an extinction event near the base. So, and, and above the base, we've got these carbon isotope peaks, 2p up to 5p. And really in this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on the interval from 543 to 528 million years ago. So um, another thing that um, that record didn't have was a continuous uh, Ediacaran record to pin the base in place, but also um, to look at the transitionary, potential transitionary fossil assemblages across um, the late Ediacaran and Lower Cambrian. And uh, this, this Ediacaran fossil record and chemostratigraphic record has been calibrated dramatically over the last 10 years. Lots of, uh, lots of changes have been made, lots of additional data. And this is mainly um, uh, due to new carbon isotope data, high resolution um, stratigraphic work by Franz McDonald and others at Harvard and, and Johns Hopkins, really. And, um, international um, work by several other research institutes around the world, including lots and lots of gene data from South China um, and Oman. Um, 
And across the last 10 years, the, this model has shifted slightly, finer scale attributes have shifted slightly. The, the age of the Shrem excursion obviously has been um, has been increased and, and the Shrem excursion has been constrained by re, uh, Rini Mosmium ages back in 2020. Um, and in 2021, Xuan uh, Yang and myself and others published uh, this uh, updated age model with some new radiometric constraints that uh, dated from South China and from the White Sea area of Russia to help um, calibrate the, the trends in carbon isotope data and, and um, other environments that lack carbon isotope um, constraints um, like the White Sea area. And so what you end up with now on the right hand side here are composite stratigraphic columns um, with associated fossil records and biostratigraphy. And, um, and on the left, you've got the carbon isotope data, and each carbon isotope data point is color coded by region. So, um, uh, in the strontium isotope compilation, you have these these colors corresponding to all of the data in the carbon isotope curve, and also all the radiometric data here are also colored by by provenance. So, for example, um, the green data points here are from Oman, and those uh, green green osmium ages. Are from a man and the black data points and black Vini Mosman majors from Laurentia and so on. And what you end up with is um, it looks relatively straightforward. But what you end up with is a is a temporally calibrated and spatially calibrated data set. So you can look at exactly where and when these fossils are occurring and also can calibrate your geochemical data within the age model. And this um, this age model that we put together for Schwann's paper. Um, really calibrates quite well some intervals of the of the pre-550 million year ago Ediacaran record. Um, and so the natural follow-up to that was to try and recalibrate the later part of the record and, and, and stitch it together with the Cambrian. So that's what we did um, for a follow-up paper in Earth Science Reviews. And this interval, so at the top here, um, all the colored data points correspond to data from uh, different areas, just like the last figure. So in red are data from the Nama group in Namibia and South Africa. And in green are data from Oman and black data from Laurentia, um, various different sections in Laurentia. And blue are from South China. And this interval 550 to 538 recently has been updated to include loads of radiometric constraints. So we've got loads of high precision local bridge ID TIMS ages from interbedded volcanic tuff deposits. Um, and uh, with that comes a new sort of appreciation of the uncertainties involved in this interval. So I I'm going to go through that in a fair bit of detail uh, to try and show you some alternative correlations for the chemostratigraphic data and resulting alternative correlations for the fossil record throughout this interval. So this is, the, this is what we have at the moment on the left hand side, the carbon isotope curve itself. This is not the only model. There are several models um, that satisfy the radiometric constraints, which is sort of unfortunate, but at the same time, that's the reality. That's also the carbon isotope data that we're dealing with. We have to deal with a lot of uncertainties in, in regional versus global carbon isotope signals, but also uh, differences in interpretation of, of the depositional age of some of the ash beds relative to um, uh, either maximum depositional age or actual depositional age and this sort of thing. So I'll go through that interval and mainly focusing in on uh, the interval from 543 to 528. And I'd be very happy to talk in more detail about the uncertainties at the end. So there are many places we can go um, around the world to look at the Ediacaran and Cambrian fossil record and to calibrate the record. Um, and really what we what we need for chemostrigraphy in this respect for, for carbon isotope chemostrigraphy is, is really carbonate. So we're looking for mixed Prefer preferably mixed carbonate silicoclastic successions that host um, both soft bodied and biomineralizing late Ediacaran early Cambrian organisms, but also areas that have ash beds. And for this talk, I've, I've just, um, I, I'm gonna only talk about five regions because we don't really have time to talk about the entire, the entire world, although I, I'd like to talk about some, some other areas as well. So the regions that I've chosen are the ones that have um, relatively continuous and thick sections that, ha that have carbonates in them from below and above the boundary. Um, and also those areas that host radiometric constraints from interbedded volcanic tuff deposits in the late Diacrin uh, record. So unfortunately, I won't be talking about South China, um, although we can, we can bring that in at the, at the end. And there are some really important uh, 
uh, fossils in South China specifically that are very helpful for constraining assemblage overlap across the base. So we'll discuss them in some um, small detail to, uh, at the end. Um, but the, the areas that I've chosen are um, Oman, uh, South, uh, uh, South Africa and, and Namibia, uh, Southwest Laurentia, Mongolia and Siberia. And I'll talk about them in, in that order. And of course, uh, this means that I will be talking about other people's work before I get to Siberia, which is where my own work has, has been focused. But it's a necessary thing to, to talk about all of these other areas to try and draw together a holistic understanding of exactly what was going on around the world at this time and see where the uncertainties lie. So first to uh, Oman. Um, and this area has been studied in massive detail, not only because it's fascinating from the point of view of um, Neoproterozoic and Cambrian stratigraphy, but also because it's um, a petroleum deposit. So a lot of the work here has been done using wireline logs and um, correlation um, and geophysical methods by PDO and Shell. And for the interval that we're looking at, the interval that we're interested in from 543 to 528, we're looking at the R group mainly. So on the right here is a, is a cross-sectional simplified cross-section of exactly what's going on in the R group. So the, the most important thing to realize in this South Oman salt basin, which is where all, all of these cores, the important cores that I'll be talking about come from, is that the majority of the carbonates in the cores come from stringers, which are floating evaporite. And they're very, very difficult to correlate laterally. And there are numerous different possible correlations um, and the, this is not just my view, but also the view of uh, people that I've spoken to in PDO and Shell. Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, um, these are also really important uh, stringers because they host skeletal organisms late in the Akron age, they host Namoclathus and Cloudina, and they also host radiometric ages from ash beds, um, with several of them, which, which tie together carbon isotopes from the stringers um in time so uh, back in 2003 there's a study by amthor um, and others that looked at carbon isotopes within several different cores from the south of Mansalt salt basin um, and one of the most important ones that i i will be talking about is this this a4 stringer which has an associated negative carbon isotope anomaly in it which goes down to around minus 4.5 it has uh, uh, there's some data down to on minus five, but very few. And then um, a recovery up through a four carbonate stringer, um, and then uh, values of carbon isotope, they go up to about 2.5 to three per mil, and they sort of plateau, and then they uh, vary. But the, basically, the, uh, within the A4 carbonate unit, you have um, mash beds, and I'll show that in the next, the next slide. Um, we, we know that, each of these carbonate units were deposited during um, relative sea level rise, flooded the, um, the evaporite basin. And some nice work by um, Stefan Schroeder and John Grotzinger in 2005 showed this at high, high resolution scale lithostratigraphy. So um, we know that each of these carbonate, and it's sort of intuitive, each of these carbonate unit, units was deposited during um, uh, seawater sea infill of the evaporite basin and, and open. We think possibly open marine or, or or near open marine carbonate deposition, although a lot of it's dolomite. Not all of it is is, is dolomitized. Um, but what Amthor showed was that the A1 to A3 carbonate stringers host cloudina and namoclathus. Um, and there are no cloudina and namoclathus above the A3 stringer. In 2007, Sam Bowering and others published this paper, um, uh, including high resolution uh, uranium isotope. No, uranium lead dating of um, ash beds interbedded with the ARA um, carbonate units and also in Namibia. Um, and this A4 unit has an age of 541 million years old. And this is a chemical abrasion age with the, um, and with the updated uranium A constant, this age doesn't really change at all. So it's still around 541. And that's been used to pin the onset of a negative excursion at 541. Mm -hmm. So, um, that, that is also what um, Adam Malouf and others and, and people since then have been using to constrain the onset of the base excursion and saying that it's at 541, which is completely reasonable. Um, and the fact that we have uh, 
the absence of cloud ina and nanoclathus above this also fits in with that. We have a uh, negative excursion associated with the base and uh, no cloud ina, and then above that is um, uh, presumably our um, our Cambrian age carbonate deposits. Um, although there are actually no um, small shelly fossil records I'm aware of anyway from the uh, from the A5 A6 uh, carbonate stringers. So this is something to bear in mind. We have an age of 541 um, million years ago from a negative excursion interval in Oman. When you put together a lot of these sections and look at the oxygen isotopes as well, in, in these figures on the right-hand side, oxygen isotopes are in orange and the carbon isotopes are in black. So the A4 stringer here is pinned by a ready metric gauge within the same core, not this one, it's a core called BB5, which has exactly the same essentially um, carbon isotope. Um, record in it. Um, the oxygen isotopes are quite heavy. They're between minus five and zero per mil um, throughout this interval. And uh, above that and below that, we have um, halite and gypsum deposits of uh, within a restricted environment. So this is the record of of um, iron nanoclathus that extends up through A1, A2, and AC, A3C, and um, stops at A3C. So no more iron nanoclathus above that level. In Oman. So the next place I'd like to go to is the Nama group, um, which is deposited in both South Africa and um, Southern Namibia. So on the left here, is, uh, um, the, the figure just shows the outcrop extent of the Nama group within Namibia and, and uh, Southwest Africa. I could talk about a few different sections in, in the Nama group, mainly within this, this southern subbasin called the Lipput subbasin. In southern Namibia, we've got several sections that archive rocks of the upper Nama group, which um, should be roughly coeval with um, the Oman record. But actually, um, because more recently last year, of course, um, uh, Val Nelson did a great talk last year on this exact subject, got a very good um, record of, of very high resolution carbon isotopes and multiple radiometric constraints from another succession, which is connected to the Nama group possibly deposited within a separate sub-basin called the Vjolstrift sub-basin. And this succession is on the Night Namibu Plateau. I'm just going to very briefly summarize the findings of, of Lyle Nelson and others, which were published, la published last year in EPSL. Um, so here we've got their composite record, and it shows no evidence of a negative carbon isotope excursion. Uh, and yet, the radiometric constraints go right up to 538 million years ago, so 537.95. And these are all interbedded ash beds that have been dated by chemical corrosion ID tins. And the record of cloud ion goes way above um, 541. It goes up to 538 or 538.56 um, into their Bayesian age depth model. And again, there's no record of a negative cloud ion excursion in this interval. And in their paper, um, Lyle and others, they um, they, they they argued that either uh, the Nama group doesn't record seaward composition or that the base is younger, 538 million years ago, which is consistent with some of the, with one of the correlation models that we put together for the Science Reviews manuscript. So um, in, their, in their contribution, they, they um, calibrated very accurately using a, a Bayesian age depth model and multiple radiometric constraints, minimum ages of some of these Ediacaran soft body fossils. Um, and, and skeletal fossil cladina and namoclathus. Um, and importantly also, I haven't mentioned this, but the Ediac and Cambrian boundary at present is defined by the first appearance of a particular igno species called Treptichthys pedum. In this succession, um, they record this igno species, which um, by lateral correlation to other sections of the null group, you, you may assume then that the first appearance of Treptichthys pedum as calibrated in Nama succession is younger than the youngest radiometric constraint um, from the Night Nabu Plateau. And that's kind of important. So I'll come back to that later on. Um, the next record I'll go to is from Southwest Laurentia. And there are multiple sections in Southwest Laurentia that have been studied in great detail by um, Johns Hopkins Group, Emmy Smith and others. And uh, most recently, um, earlier this year, I think, or maybe just late last year, um, Emmy published this, this composite record from uh, California and Nevada. And um, of, in, within this record, you've got multiple sections, high resolution carbon isotope, chemistry would be exactly what you want, and, um, and high resolution uh, paleontological records as well. 
And there are just two sections that I'm going to focus on here that have been published previously um, and expanded on. And this study, this composite study, uh, agrees with the findings of those two previous um, papers. So first of all, is Mount Dunphy in, in Nevada. Um, in 2016 and, and later in 2020, there were publications that, um, that uh, presented these data, the carbon isotope data and, and, the, and the fossil record from Mount Dunphy. And um, uh, the authors correlated the basal Cambrian carbon isotope excursion, the base excursion within the, uh, within the Esmeralda member, middle Esmeralda member, um, the deep spring formation. And within that negative excursion interval, we have these uh, tubular fossils, Costa tubulus and Sarina, which were reinterpreted in, um, in this paper by Selly and others. And that uh, these occurrences lie within some part of the base excursion by, um, by correlation, um, it, the interpretation of this correlation with the base um, by Smith and others. Um, and secondly, the first appearance of the ichnospecies species that defines the base of the Cambrian triptan pedum occurs just above the nadir of this base excursion, or possibly within peak, um, it will call peak 2P, um, just above the base excursion. So um, this is a really, really important section because it has cloud inids, which are these, or cloud anamorphs, which are, um, include these two, um, these two species, um, or these two genera, Costatubulus and Sarina. And um, they, occur, they appear after the last occurrence of cloud ina within the succession. Um, we also have the base, and we also have the first appearance of Treptonus pedum, the lowest occurrence, I should say, of Treptonus pedum in this environment. And the other section I want to go to in, um, in this part of um, the Great Basin is the Montgomery Mountains section, which has been known for a really long time, and uh, where um, Smith and others recently published these new carbon isotope data, calibrate some important soft body fossils. So back in 2017, me and others published um, this, this um, stratigraphic uh, framework for the, for the fossils and hemostriophy of um, the Montgomery Mountains, Death Valley. And they, uh, their, their new isotope data and these isotope data confirmed that the, uh, lo the last occurrence or the highest occurrence of erniotomorphs, these soft-bodied um, ediacaran type fossils, is just above um, or within, potentially within the nadir interval of the base um, in this environment. These include um, Ernietta and, and another Ernietta more fossil with this strange cross hatched. <clears throat> and also within this interval, you have Cloudina just below that. And, um, uh, and above that, you have the first prince of Treptinus pedum, which is also just above the nadir of this big negative excursion, which could correlate with the base. So the third place to go to in um, Southwest Laurentia is Sonora in Mexico. And this paper was published by Arjun and others back in 2020. And they show a very, very similar record from um, Sonora, whereby you have this negative excursion, which could correlate with the base. And then above that, you have the first prince of Tractinus pedum. But within that interval, in the nadir interval, actually, or just above the nadir, potentially, you have um, this uh, zircon uranium lead age from a sandy dollar stone, um, which they interpret as a maximum depositional age of around 539.4 million years ago. And below the base interval, you have um, these cloud inids and tubular fossils. So the last place I'm going to go to before I actually get to my own work <laughs> is Mongolia. Um, and this is a really interesting record also. It has um, a number of features in common with the Laurentian data set and also with, um, with other records. So uh, this is also work done by Emmy Smith and others, Johns Hopkins. And, um, they, they published a, a lot of carbon isotope data and then tried to um, fit in some paleontological information from um, previously published works, um, mostly by Russian scientists and others by, by Brazier et al. in 1996. Um, and the, the issue with Mongolia is that it's quite technically complex. Um, more recently, just um, at, the, at the beginning of last year, Tim Topper and others calibrated some new fossil finds within one of the sections. So this is Bayern Gold section. And there they, they found uh, co-occurring cladinids and protoconodonts, which are lowermost Cambrian small skeletal fossils um, within uh, this interval of Bayern Gold, and also some indeterminate tubular fossils, some of which may be Cambridge tubulus, um, and others uh, uh, like Zunia, which are cladinids, 
within the um, interval that just slightly underlies negative excursion in the upper Zuna Arts formation, which they correlate with the base. So I'm just going to go into that in a little more detail because it warrants some some um, some more words. So this is the buy and goal section. This is a photograph supplied to me by Andrei Zhravlev um, on a recent field trip that he went on. So the hammer in the eye-wateringly close foreground is uh, the upper Zuna Arts um, formation by, and uh, buy and goal formation contact. And the most most of the photograph uh, just behind the cars and to the right of the image is, is the lower buy and goal formation. Um, so if we if we integrate the carbon isotope data set of Smith and the one collected by Topper and all the fossils um, presented in, in the, the paper by Topper, um, we come to, I mean, it, the, the carbon isotope correlation is unequivocal, really. And I've just put the oxygen isotopes on here in case you're interested as well. Um, we have the base excursion right at the top of the Zune Arts formation. In other sections, it's at the base of the Iron Goal formation. Um, and the, the fossil record that's presented by Tim Topper and others uh, is shown to the right. It, I, I've just extended the line going from this Cambro tubulus down. Uh, they they call it an indistinct tubular fossil. It's quite possible that it is, but I've just potentially, with a question mark, inferred the lowest kinds of Cambro tubulus a little bit lower than they've put it, which is up here. So we've got this um, uh, cloud ionid, Zunia, that uh, goes right across the base excursion and coincides in the same section with the first appearance of protoconodonts just above the base. Um, which then, and then you have this um, other organisms like Anaborites and uh, Halkiaria within the lowermost Cambrian iron gold formation. So this is just, again, this is just my range extension possible range extension of Cambridge Euless. This is not important right now. Um, but if we put together the records that I've presented so far into one composite figure, all of these sections are to scale with one another. I quite like doing this just to see how different different environments are. Um, relative ages are just my own inferred, uh, the, the position of each of these within this figure, basically my inferred um, uh, pr preference for relative age. So you have this negative excursion at the base, which is like very, very consistent between sections in the Rentia and also is really consistent with the record from Mongolia. Um, and below the base, you have the last occurrence or the, the highest occurrence of cloud inids and small and, so, and soft body fossils. And above the base, you have the first appearance of, in some sections, um, small skeletal fossils, although you don't really see them in, in the Laurentian record because the um, record transitions mainly to siliciclastic a dominated um, environment. Um, in Laurentia, you had the first appearance of Trepton of Pedum, which marks the um, Cameron Cameron boundary by definition, very, very close to the recovery from the base. Uh, in Namibia, there is no base. Um, and the record extends right up to 537.95 million years ago. And in Oman, the base itself, if this is the base at 541, th there are several possibilities of possible correlations that you could come to with this, but most parsimoniously, because we have the, um, the last occurrence of Cloudina and Namaklathus in A3, which is bracketed by a radiometric age of 542.9, we know that in Namibia, um, Cloudina and Namaklathus extend way, way beyond this, up to 539.63, based on the radiometric constraints, and in and Cloudina right up to 538.56. So the record from a man is looking slightly Maybe slightly misleading, but I'll come back to that later on because there is a possible a possible correlation um, that unifies all of these radiometric constraints. And uh, from Sonora, of this age five hundred thirty nine point four, it's close to maximum depositional age. Then it matches quite nicely with a man. Um, it it is interpreted as a maximum depositional age, and so maybe it's considerably younger than five hundred thirty nine point four potentially. And again, I'm being very even-handed here. It could be one of several possibilities. So I'll show them near the end. But lastly, I'm going to go to Siberia. And this is where it gets slightly complicated. Um, the Siberian platform is enormous. And there, is, there are a huge number of sections that you can go to to, to uh, focus in on the late Eakron to Cambrian record. So uh, like I said, the Siberian platform is, is absolutely huge. It's about a third the size of China. Um, covers greater than three and a half million square kilometers and um, has a number of different uh, fasci zones 
in it. So just th this is just a simplified um, Fasci's map of part of the lower Cambrian Siberian platform. And I'm going to be focusing on the southeast Siberian platform where I've pinned these sections YMC, NV, and KY. So in the southwest Siberian platform, we have this, um, this area with um, indigenous foreland deposits, which were quite close to, um, or are presumed to have been quite close to collision with some microcontinents that, um, around the southwest Siberian platform. And then we've got this enormous saloniferous clastic fasces area, um, which is full of evaporites and, and very thin carbonate interbeds. And there are a number of drill core um, profiles throughout this, this environment, and also some, um, uh, some river and bank um, sections. And then we have a transitional fasces belt, which is um, transitional and open marine carbonate fasces that deepen out towards the northwest. And then this deeper environment or inferred deeper environment um, throughout this, um, this western, or oh, sorry, this eastern edge. Um, and then an uplift area up here. So the Olenek uplift up here and, and also the um, Volker anticline, these places up in the northeast, which have been studied in great detail by um, Nick Kaufman, Andy Noll, and others back, um, and, and also was very, very many uh, Russian contributions within the uh, late 20th century. So to go to the southeast Siberian platform, um, we have these, these sections that are along riverbanks. This is not a very helpful map, but this is what we got to work with um, uh, from Google Maps. Um, so one of the most famous sections in the west part of this, this area is the Vortsee section, which has been looked at in great detail because it was um, very close to another section called Ulakan Suluga, which was um, uh, proposed as a possible boundary stratified section um, back in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and the other sections that I'll be looking at a little later are Dumamaya Confluence, New Chalak Valley, which I showed the photograph at the beginning, and Kira Itika. First to Vortsee. This is a very important section. It has carbon isotope data, which have been published um, in the 1980s and 90s. This is what Devolte looks like in outcrop. It's absolutely beautiful, enormous section. Um, and uh, it's, it outcrops along the Aldan River in Southeast Siberia. So the carbon isotope profiles best published by Magaritz and others in, in Nature in 1986. And they show this recovery from a big negative excursion at the bottom going right up to a significant positive excursion at the top. And this actually really looks a lot like um, Fortunian to stage two carbon isotope record globally. And this is how Adam Maloof and others correlated it. And then there's this enormous unconformity, which is um, uh, it's called the, the basal pestrate formation unconformity, above which you have um, uh, late stage two to Atabanian deposits, some of which have archaeocytes and trilobites in them. Um, the record, I'll show you in a minute, the record from Dvortsi and uh, neighboring sections is actually quite complicated. Um, and Brazier and others, Martin Brazier and others published uh, the biostratigraphy of the section uh, with some more carbon isotope data um, and a more detailed lithostratigraphic uh, log of Dvortsi back in 1993. Um, so where else can we go around this area to, to look at lithostratigraphic correlation and look at the paleontological record of these sections? Well, there are quite a few different sections you can go to. All the numbers here correspond to sections that have been studied in the Russian literature mainly um, since the 1990s and actually right back, some of them back to the 1970s. Um, so we can, and, and they have a varying degree of, of detail in the original, in original Russian publications, but some of the sections have um, very detailed meter scale, bed by bed, lithostratigraphic descriptions. So I, for our contribution in GSA Bulletin this year, I uh, I needed some help with the with the Russian translations because I don't speak Russian. And so my friend Andrei Zhravlev, um, he painstakingly translated bed by bed litho, uh, lithostratigraphic descriptions and paleontological information from a lot of Russian um, journals, Russian Russian publications back since the um, the nineteen well nineteen eighties nineties mainly. Um, from these sections in Southeast Siberia, because, and I'll show you why exactly in a minute, there are some controversial correlations going on down in the Southeast Siberian platform. So this is a nice picture of Andrei Shrava taken by me in 2016 in Namibia. Um, and he's the one to thank for the translations we now have in the supplementary information of our um, GSA Bulletin manuscript. So how helpful are these um, lithostratigraphic correlations? 
So we've got these sections down south of Dvortsi now. And at Dvortsi, we can now pin exactly where the, the fossils are occurring within the same section um, based on the reported um, uh, stratigraphic correlation, the reported section information. And I tried to go into as much detail as possible here when I put together these logs, um, because I thought, you know, it, maybe it would be helpful to have the color of these beds actually figured and to see whether there's any correlation with, with the, you know, marker beds of different color. The first thing to note is that at Dvortsi, the first appearance of Anabarites and Chancelloids occurs just below the pre Svet unconformity, right at the top of the Eustudermal formation. So this is this whole Dolomite unit is the Eustudermal formation. And these are the data that are published by Nagaritz and Peja and others um, back in the 80s and 90s. And you can see that the, the first occurrence of Anabarites and Chancelloids occurs right near the top where we have this positive carbonized peak. And this carbonized peak has been correlated um, in, in the past and also in Earth Science Reviews uh, manuscript to peak 4.5 or 5p near the top of the Fortunian and lower stage two, near the top of Fortunian. <clears throat> Uh, in, in other sections, the Eustodomal formation, which is dominated by dollar stone, um, it has a number of different members in it, and the lateral correlation is quite difficult. Um, but uh, according to the correlation by Brazier and others, and Komentovsky and others in the Russian publications, members should be relatively um, easy to correlate across. So you have the first appearance of Halkiaria and um, Halkiaria, Spyliths. Um, mollusks and anabarites way below the first appearance of anabarites or Chancelloria in Fortsi. And so actually it looks like the first occurrence of these fossils in the Eustodoma formation is, is quite strongly dependent on um, the lithology in which they're found. So the, these um, occurrences to the south of Fortsi are mainly found in what are described as limey dollar stones or, or even limestones, whereas in Dvortsi, um, the first occurrence is such a uh, um, the lith lithology is actually really close to the top. In other sections, it's much further down. So you have this possible taphonomic artifact of exactly where these fossils are appearing on the shelf to basin, because um, I should have mentioned this already, but as you go south or east in Fortsi, you're getting into deeper water fasces, according to the um, available sedimentological and lithostratigraphic information. Another thing to note is that in the sections to the east and south of Fortsi, um, you have uh, you have the pre eustodermal formation, AIM formation, underlying the strata of the eustodermal dolomite. Whereas at Dvortsi, you have uh, the lowest occurrence of dolomite corresponding to the eustodermal formation of, above, uh, sitting on top of basement gneiss. And so the interpretation of, um, uh, of, of the basin is that you have um, diachronous transgression across the basement gneiss, position of these outer ramp. Um, lithologies out to the east and the southeast um, corresponding to the AIM formation. Now, why is this important? Why am I going into such detail here? The reason is that we've got um, these sections further out in the east, which have historically been correlated with the most outer ramp sections of the Siberian platform. And the most controversial aspect actually comes from this KY section up in the top right-hand side, the northeast side of this, um, this map. Um, and the reason is uh, it's controversial, I'll, I'll talk about in the next slide. So these are the three sections we've got. We've got YM, Udomimaya Confluence, NV, Nuchalak Valley, and KY, Curiotica. And they are meant to, or they're supposedly deepen out from this section right out to Curiotica here. And potentially the strata get older, um, or the, the older strata become older further to the east due to the diachronous transgression. Now, in 2007, uh, 2017, sorry, um, uh, Marianne and others um, published the, this carbon isotope profile from the Curiotica section, the most distal section, um, and they correlated the carbon isotopes that you see this plateau here with the late ediacaran positive carbon isotope plateau, which precedes the onset of the base, this, the negative excursion with the basal Cambrian. The controversy lies in the fact that in the um, late ediacaran part, if this is Correct, then the late Ediacaran part hosts the first appearance of Anabarites below the base. But not only that, it also hosts the first appearance of Photoconodonts, Chancelloids, Halkiarids, and Higher Lethal Minthes, and also Diplocriterion, which is um, this ichnofossil. Uh, importantly, within this section, regardless of where you put it, you have co occurring cloudinids and Anabarites, and that's a really important point because um, 
uh, it basically confirmed within the same section the transition were assemblage. And this is something you also, um, I, I showed you from Mongolia, the record from Tim Topper and others, they have co-occurring clavinids and protoconobunts. So you have, you have uh, multiple instances of co-occurring clavinids um, and, uh, and small skeletal fossils that have previously been interpreted to lie only within the Cambrian. Now, the, the actual precise position of the Kiritika section relative to the base is, is the controversy here. <clears throat> Um, now, when we put together the record that we have, we have these two other sections relative to the record from the Bortsy, and we looked at these two, these possible sort of correlations, not only with lithostratigraphy and carbon isotope space, but also with the bioastrography. Got this new section, Nuchark Valley, which was all these samples were collected by Rachel and Marianne and Andre and others uh, back in the same field excursion that they went to collect the, the Kiritika section. Um, uh, carbon isotope samples and, um, and biostratigraphic information. Um, the records in these two sections are not identical, and it's really quite complicated to try and work out exactly how they correlate. We've wanted some um, detail in the, in, in the paper trying to argue for different possible correlations with these two sections. Ultimately, um, one of the problems with, with the correlation, or one of the, one of the uncertainties in the correlation, lies within um, the possibility for uh, a hiatus at the boundary between the AIM and the Eustodoma formation, so this um, dolomitic shale interval and the dollar stone. Or at, at um, Kiritika, there's really no evidence of a, of a hiatus here. It looks more like um, a, a, a deeper water limestone deposit. It, very, very similar, in fact, to the, the Shibantan or the Katispit formation, limestone and um, shale interbeds um, transitioning straight up into dollar stone of a potential high sand systems tract. Um, so what we did was we tried to look at if if we can't say with with great confidence whether or not this is pre-base or post-base, we looked at the two end member possibilities based on um, visual carbon isotope alignment and also different um, depositional models across the shelf to base and how could these things either be free base or post base looking at the lithostratigraphy and sequence stratigraphy relative to the Bortzi section. The first option is that they are pre base um, as correlated by Marianne and others in 2017. This is a controversial, this is controversial only because we have parents of many different types of small skeletal fossils that are presumably Cambrian base. It's not controversial in one respect in that you have cloud diners where they should be pre base according to a lot of other um, sections. And um, that would correlate uh, these more basinal um, sections uh, with an interval of non-deposition at Dvorzi, pre-base, pre, pre the um, diaclinous transgression that flooded onto the Dvorzi platform. The alternative is that these are post-base and there is a, a potentially significant hiatus, at least in this section, New Tower Valley, uh, at the aim Eustodoma formation contact. And that would correlate this interval at Nuchalak Valley with the, the Z interval up to 5P, which is much, much later. Um, and what's interesting there is that you don't have um, anabarited or cambrotubulus occurring until very, very late. So this is actually at the zero per mil crossing point, probably, with um, the recovery from 5P. Whereas um, the, the record at Kiritika then would fit with, basically all fit with 5P. Um, and there's potential for for some deviation from uh, from uh, water carbon isotope composition associated with um, organic matter uh, degradation in the water column. So to go into a lot of detail here is impossible in the talk, but um, I'd encourage you to look at the two possibilities we put forward in this um, in this paper. And these are certainly uncertain. So there's a lot more work needs to be done here. Unfortunately, it's uh, impossible to get to these sections to analyze them for carbon isotopes. It would be great to have um, uh, actual carbon isotope data and biostratigraphic information from the same collections within all of these sections to try and correlate these more accurately with one another. But in the end, we did our best and we tried to um, look at the two end member possibilities with the data that we had available. I would note also that um, there are two other sections that are quite important for late Ediacaran or probably late Ediacaran biostrophy and carbon isotope chemistry in the Siberian platform. And these are um, the Sakaraka River section, which has got this 
continuous carbon isotope profile right up to, um, into the Atabanian and beyond. And um, recently has been shown to have cambrotubulus, which is these um, smooth walled um, tubular organisms below 1N, which has been correlated with the base. And also the um, lower Turkut formation, which hosts this um, uh, probable, cam probable cambrotubulus uh, fossil, which is also probably pre base based on the, um, the correlations, the stratigraphic and chemostratic correlations. Um, so yeah, we, we looked at those sections, but we also looked at several other sections in different fasciate regions. So there are loads, loads and loads of carbon isotope data from the Siberian platform, from outcrop and drill core. And what we did was we tried to look in each environment and build up um, sort of local um, correlations between sections that you could look at on, on, a, re on a, or a very local scale with each, within each of these um, major study areas. And um, again, if you're interested, I would encourage you to look at the um, supplementary information for this because it looks at the different correlations between these sections within each region. And what we used this for was to build a composite or a, a two actual possible alternative composites by visual carbon isotope alignment for the, carbon, for the Siberian platform. And these are shown on the, on the left here, models E and F. And I just tried to continue on from the Earth Science Reviews correlations that I put together in the in age model. Um, so these are models E and F after A to D in the Earth Science Reviews manuscript. And these basically, they come up with very different um, possible correlation to biostratigraphy, but overall the sequence stratigraphy or platform-wide sequence stratigraphy is, is very, very similar. And it shows um, region, a regional um, or at least a relative sea level rise across base interval from, from just before the base nadir, most likely the sequence boundary, sequence four, and pulsed sea level rise right through the Cambrian, which is actually, it's, it's uh, known from global successions. Uh, including the sort of transgression in, in, uh, in Laurentia, or at least one of these would be potentially correlated with the sort of transgression. And this sequence five here, sequence boundary five, is the pre pestered Svets um, uh, unconformity. So, what it does differently in, in, um, in carbon isotope space and biostratigraphy, the biostratigraphy correlation across, um, across this interval. Um, in diamonds here, the gray diamonds are the biostratigraphic correlation according to the Kiriatika section and all the other gray data points of Siberian sections um, outside of this Southeast Siberian platform area. All the other data points, co colors corresponding to the different provenance, so blue, again, blue South China, Laurentia, and so on. But we've got these sections in Southeast Siberia, according to one correlation, which places the Kiriatika section pre-base. These are our, um, our, our pre-base, very early first occurrences or lowest occurrences of things like rhodoconodonts, halkiaries, chancellorids, and so on. Whereas the second correlation, which um, situates these carbon isotope data in the lithostratigraphy in the Southeast Siberian platform, 5P correlates those, as you can see in the right, right part of that column, um, correlates the uh, biostratigraphy with the latter part of the 5P peak, which is the most reasonable visual alignment of those carbon isotope data post-base. And that makes all of those occurrences quite late, although actually they're, they're within the lowest occurrences of several other sections in that interval. What is different, though, is when you look at the, the, the maximum range extension of Cloudina uh, that, that um, is correlated with these two models. So model E, the pre-base model for Kiriatika, would correlate Cloudina pre-base with most other places, whereas model F would correlate Cloudina with, um, with an interval well, it would basically extend the range of cloud iron by several million years, um, according to our understanding of the the age of the of the of the base and the, the age of the Fortunian, <clears throat> or the age range of the Fortunian. Um, and also in Mongolia, the record that I showed uh, these zunia cloud iron they also extend beyond the base, and that's confirmed within the Mongolian section within the same section and the same carbon isotopes, quite confidently. So. For the last, I've, I've already ran over quite a lot, but I'm going to just show you the, um, the age model construction for two possibilities of the base age and also um, what they would mean with respect to um, assemblage overlap of the EDF and Cambrian using all of the sections that I have shown in this, um, in this talk. So um, in uh, this recent paper by Emmy Smith, uh, the age of the base native was suggested around 539, and this is based on the age from 
uh, Mexico, 539.4, and also the onset age of the base uh, calibrated within Oman at 541. So the first thing I'm going to show is a biostratigraphic um, output that's correlated to carbon isotope um, data with that base age and what it looks like. Here it is. Um, what this does essentially is it implies that the carbon isotope data in Namibia, shown in red here on the left, um, are not recording seawater composition. Onset of the base at 541, nadir of the base near 539.4, according to the age from Laurentia. And then um, all the, the Fortunian carbon isotope data can be fitted above 539.4. So first of all, what that does, here is triptychnus pedum on the right-hand side. I should have labeled it, really. That's triptychnus pedum. And um, the carbon isotope data match nicely with the, well, roughly, with the first occurrence sorry, the, the uh, first, the lowest occurrence based on radiometric constraints from Namibia within 2P. So the, the carbon isotope occurrence of EPDM is pinned um, at its lowest point in Laurentia at 2P. And that would then um, match nicely with the lowest occurrence, lowest possible occurrence in Namibia at 500, roughly 538 million years ago. Um, the base nadir is at around 538.8, and this means that the age of the of the Eagan Cameron boundary defined by the International Chronostratigraphic Chart 538.8 is not that far away from the first appearance of Tempedon. Um, we have overlap in, in this age model, I should have said, um, is the pre-base Curiatica age model. We've got loads of overlap with small um, showy fossils. Um, with, with the late Ediacaran record. So this is what happens when you correlate Kiraitika pre-base. You've got this drawdown of all of these different groups, Hyalith or Minthes and Halkiariids and Chancelloids and so on. Um, Zunia and Protoconodonts in Mongolia overlap. So this is the, the most extreme overlap that you could have um, with our current um, data. Now, if you correlate Kiraitika post base, this is what happens. You still have overlap. You have over overlap between cloudinids and protoconodonts in Mongolia alone. You also have a range extension of cloudinids by cloudina occurrence in Kiraitika section right up to 5p. Um, and I mean, the, the position of the first prince of Treptinus pedum doesn't change relative to the carbon isotope curve. <clears throat> this, is, this is just a, a, a shifting the stratigraphic constraints from Kiraitika up into the lower Cambrian. Now, the second possibility is that you disconnect the base nadir from the A4 excursion um, on the assumption that the base should, uh, should be recorded after record from the ninth number of week or so in uh, Namibia. And also uh, the possibility for either a distinct negative excursion at 541 cor um, corresponding to the record from Oman or um, local effects of a basin restriction or some or, or some di genetic effects in Oman at 541 that, that are um, that and that's what's actually um, or some other mechanism by which you might have uh, potentially reworking of zircons within the ash beds in um, in the A4 uh, carbonate stringer. And what that does is separate out records of the Cambrian and the Ediacaran somewhat. You still do have um, overlap with Zunia and cloud dynamos and and um, and protoconodonts. Again, this is, this is calibrating Kiraitika pre-base. So you have some overlap consistent with the record of drawn down by the pre-base age of Kiraitika. And the final one, which is the least controversial potentially, but also is, is just as, um, as probable or um, uncertain also as the other correlations, is that you have the least amount of overlap. But then again, this is corresponding to this is ca calibrating the Kiraitic section to 5p, and you would, by um, same reasoning, extend Cloudina fast occurrence up to 5p. So you have assemblage overlap with Cloudina and protoconodons and other things in the Fortunian record. And Cloudina and, again, protoconodons uh, overlap in Mongolia alone. So you have assemblage overlap in every single situation. And I think I'm going to have to leave it there because otherwise, um, Otherwise, we won't have time for any questions because I've just realized I've reached an hour in the talk. So I'm going to leave the conclusions up here. The main conclusions are that you have an assemblage overlap corresponding to cloud co occurring cloud dynids and protoponodonts um, and cloud dynids and anabaritids in some sections. 
uh, regardless of what model you use. So I, I'll leave it there um, and I'm happy to take any questions or talk about this further. All right, thanks, Fred. Yeah, sorry, I could have sent you a little, uh, re like a notification or something about all right. time. That's all right. <laughs> um, no, we're doing fine. Uh, we can go ahead and start with the discussion part. I have a couple of things in the chat. You can ask by either typing into the chat or raising your hand. That raise hand button is at the bottom of your screen. You click the reactions, and then um, it's just that first button on the bottom there. Um, so Fred, K. Sander Sarwan asked sort of early on, is the high positive delta 13 carbon values near the start of the motion a result of the Cambrian substrate revolution? And is there any evidence concerning the agronomic revolution possibly extending back into the late Ediacaran? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I, the, the, the reasons for these carbon isotope fluctuations in the, in the, um, in the Fortunian, right? Uh, he said to motion. Okay. Um, well, it, it's still really uh, widely debated exactly what the mechanisms for this high frequency um, carbon isotope shifts are in the in the Fortunian and Timotian. Um, but I, I so I, I can't really um, comment on the on the driving mechanisms for these excursions um, at the moment. But I feel like this is the sort of thing that we could actually get to. Um, once some uh, some consensus is reached about what which one of these age models is correct, we can look at these age models and we can try and work out exactly what's going on with respect to um, local uh, relative sea level change or um, or integrate geochemical data and see exactly what's going on with respect to the geochemical environment. Um, as far as the substrate revolution goes, the, I, I have seen some papers that talk about the the effects, the possible effects on carbon isotope space. Certainly, the it looks like the late Ediacaran is is uh, hosts or the late Ediacaran rock record hosts a lot of in, interesting new um, uh, ichnofascies. I didn't talk about any um, any ichnofossils in this in this talk, um, but. Yeah, the, the first appearance of Treptinus pedum is not the first appearance of complex ichnofabrics. So you, certainly you, you have an increase in substrate um, uh, destabilization and, and, and bioturbation by mixing within the Cambrian. Um, but this is something I think maybe it would be best to talk to uh, people like Lily Tarhan and um, Alison Cribb and everybody who works on the you know, ichnofossils, Louis Boitois and, uh, and others, Gabriela Mangano. I, I couldn't honestly comment um, on that in great detail. Yeah. Maybe, Good question. Maybe we'll hear about some more at some point too. Um, but another one, just follow up from Case under Sarwan, or, or not just another question. Do we find chancellorids also in the Mongolian strata given the presence in, of halcarids in said strata? Um, so I, I, don't, I don't recall having seen uh, Within Tim Topper's data set, any chancellorite sclerites from the Biangol section, but they they only looked at the lower part of the Biangol formation. And in previous publications uh, by Gibsher and others, uh, I'm sure that chancellorites are also in that database. But I had to I'd have to check that. Although actually, I might that should be in that should be in one of the figures that I put together. Chancellorites, chancellorites are here. I don't see a green point, so maybe they're not in the Mongolian data set, or maybe they're just covered up by another data point. I can't say for sure. Um, the, um, yeah, the, the paper by Emmy Smith that looked at the carbon isotope data from Mongolia, they also collated all of the small Shelley fossil information from um, from the previous publications in that in that paper, and so I would look at that. And, and uh, all I can say for sure is that we, we don't seem to have chancellor sclerites very low in the fortune in, in the Mongolian data set. Okay. All right, so we don't have anything else in, sitting in the chat right now. So um, I saw Andre and Paul just unmuted yourselves. Andre, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah. Oh, just... we have a hand, Paul. Let's let Paul go first. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Paul. About 50 years ago, I was on the American Commission on Stratigraphic Nomenclature. And at that time, the code advised that uh, last appearances are always more reliable than first appearances. 
Mm. I wondered why this was true. And I was pulled aside and said, we don't like to talk about this, but sometimes samples are taken from what is believed to be outcrop that is actually slump blocks. And the blocks right. only move downhill, meaning mm. down section where the dips are gentle. So my yeah. question is, <laughs> is there any potential uh, for this problem uh, and particularly for, for, for specific uh, occurrences, which if you could eliminate them, <laughs> would simplify uh, stratigraphic correlations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the, the, I mean, the records, the small skeletal fossil records, the, the main, mainly the problems that we're having here are, um, are the presumed lowest occurrence data from Kira Itika. This is the main problem. Um, but actually, even within the same section, the the complex fossils are occurring at the top of the section, not near the bottom. And so you you have these co-occurrences of cloud ionids and anabrites within limey dollar stone or limestone intervals within the middle part of the ECD formation. But actually, the the all these other skeletal fossils, including chancel warriors and halkiaries and so on. They're occurring at the top of the section and beyond the top of the section. I didn't mention this either, but at Kira Itika, there is no pestered spet um, um, exposed. It goes up into a into a forested plateau, essentially. And so um, I, I don't think that that's possible just based on the outcrop. Um, I, I, I would have thought that I can't say for certain because I don't know exactly how these fossils were collected, but the, the, the collections themselves um, they've been they've been repeated and photographed and and studied by several Russian scientists, and they're always coming from the same levels within the Kiritika section. So, although that might be that, I, I see the point of not liking lowest occurrences. Uh, the problem was with the original collections. Yeah, uh, yeah. We found, you know, Francis found that the Russian work in Mongolia not too reliable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so that, that's what I understood also from the recent paper by Tim Topper on the Mongolian um, sections in that they found quite different horizons or different levels within the same section um, hosting uh, different fossils. Um, I suppose that if it were if it were a problem with the original collections um, associated with slumping or blocks, um, the, the position of Anabarites and Cloudina within the same interval, I don't think that would be affected by slumping, but certainly it would be really useful to see new collections from these sections it's just so difficult to access them that's the that's the issue i'd love to go back there myself and have a look at the at the at the sections and exactly where these samples come from um yeah i i have to work with what i'm given so i, I can't say for sure certainly this this needs more attention and i think that's why it's necessary to consider all these alternatives um the, the carbon isotopes are reliable the the fossil occurrence information is what we have. So that's all I can say. It's a good point. OK, uh, Andre, you can go next. Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering uh, this um, sea level rise that you see at the base of Cambrian. Um, it seems like you're implying that was active margin to the east of Siberia, I guess, was also active margin to the south. Uh, to what degree it reflect sort of local sea level rise on Siberian Triton versus uh, global? And if it's global, can you trace it to other cratons and correlate? Yeah, this is something I, I've thought a lot about. Um, I, I think it's a really interesting point, and I think it's um, it's something that is it's probably been thought about quite a lot in the past. So that, um, but but nobody has actually tried. I don't think to correlate with with the the accuracy that we're trying to get at here, of whether these are global, whether the sea level rise is global. But it's it's also difficult because regionally um, places are are recording um, infill sediment infill. So like in in in, um, in Namibia, you have this final pulse sea level rise just above the record in um, or, or near the top in the non -tass, lower non tass formation. But then um, uh, the record above that becomes quite coarse and plastic, and it's recovering. Or it's recording um, molasse deposit during um, basin infill, um, and that's. But that, that environment also is within the southernmost extent of converging 
um, cratonic, cratonic land masses during Gondwana amalgamation. Um, in other areas, though, there, there are several areas that do show sea level rise roughly coincident with the base. It's never exactly at the same level within the carbon isotope curve, though. So in Mongolia, the base nadir is captured in the high stand um, of the Zuna Arts formation. But above that, there's a big sequence boundary um, and, a, and a flooding surface. In, in, in the sections in, in Siberia, it, it does look very much like it, that there's a sea level rise roughly coincident or maybe just preceding the base that's, that floods the whole platform. And whether or not that's just a local um, flooding event is, it, all I can say is that in Siberia, the composite record does show consistently that the platform is being flooded almost from all sides, uh, with the possible exception of the southwest, where things remain quite shallow. Um, so it, I am really, really interested with correlating sea level rise in these carbon isotope excursions. It, it would be interesting to see how they really match up, but it's a very difficult thing to try and pin together where you have all sorts of regional um, uh, tectonics related sea level fluctuations. So potentially this is something we could get at if we have, again, some consensus with which age model is the most accurate. Something to think more about. Thank you. Okay. Um, Case under so one has another follow up in the chat to me. Are there uh, are there area cladistic cladistic studies in the Siberian platform, especially concerning its huge size, and would plotting the instances of each taxon onto a node? of the area cladistic tree convey anything meaningful regarding the timing of the base? That's a super interesting idea that I, I honestly, I, I don't know of any cladistic studies that are looking at, especially with the Fortunian record, uh, the Cambrian, I think mainly because uh, we do have quite a lot of um, what looks like taphonomic bias associated with the first occurrences, the lowest occurrences of these um, Fortunian small skeletal fossils in Siberia. So a lot of them are in actually not only in Southeast Siberia, but in other sections as well, are occurring within intervals of the limiest um, fasces or the limiest lithology, I should say. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure exactly whether that would work, but I think it would be a really cool study. There is so much data, um, but you are also relying, um, as, as Paul mentioned, you're relying on, on the, uh, the reliability of the occurrences within the same section each time, and also the correlation. The correlation within the Fortunian is also really, um, within that interval of the Fortunian is also quite difficult because um, as you can see from the figure that I left on the screen here, um, each of these carbon isotope peaks and troughs throughout the Fortunian are very, very similar in absolute magnitude. And although we're just trying to correlate um, trends in the carbon isotope data, if you have a partial section, you could almost correlate those trends across um, each of these or within two or three of these uh, within the Fortunian. So you're, and sometimes you're not looking at a complete composite section. So I, I would be wary. I mean, I, I think it would be a fantastic, fascinating study, but I would also be wary of the uncertainties involved in trying to back calculate some cladistics tree from occurrence information calibrated within the Fortunian, especially, especially also, especially since you don't have almost, you have almost no radiometric constraints within that interval to calibrate the record. So th these are, these are all, a lot of uncertainties are going into this. And what we, what we really need are, uh, are these composite um, chemostratigraphic profiles that, that link up the, the largest magnitude negative or positive carbon isolate excursions across multi-linear time intervals. So it, uh, those are the sorts of questions that I think could fuel future, res the f uh, future research um, on like a time scale of a decade or so, um, which uh, is a cool idea. Uh, but I honestly, I, I don't know who would want to get started on it at the moment. <laughs> OK. Um, questions? Uh, Paul has a follow up. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, concerning the absence of base in uh, the southernmost Nama sections, um, in the Otavi group in northern Namibia, uh, Kelsey Lamont and I 
uh, founded in, in, in specific zones, uh, both positive and negative carbon isotope excursions, which are normally uh, very reproducible, are completely eliminated. And uh, everything just goes to, you know, about plus one or so, uh, or zero per mil. Um, I don't know yeah. whether this is possible for those sections that the base was there, the anomaly and has been eliminated. That's something that pr probably could be uh, tested with calcium and magnesium isotopes. Yeah, and I, I'm familiar with your your work in the non glacial. Um, yeah, I, that, that's that's basically that's the reason that I considered that possibility as an age model. Um, but for this talk, I didn't really like the idea because I thought that um, I, I didn't really like the idea that they wouldn't that these data weren't. Um, recording the base just because I, f I felt like it, that there were other possibilities. And the one that I that I would prefer would be that the base is just later. And the fact that we have no radiometric constraints in the Fortunian makes that possible. And the fact that with the radiometric constraints that we have at 541, 539.4, both of those come from, I, I think, I think the 539.4 age is maximum depositional age. The other one is from an environment that's evaporitic. And so I would pres I would prefer to believe the NAMA, uh, and I'm using the word believe, believe the NAMA um, carbon isotope record over the Oman record. But I, I totally see the point. And yes, I, I think that it would be really cool to, to look at the calcium magnesium isotope record. I know that um, Emmy and others are working on the grind material, grind core material. And uh, I, I, not, I can't remember exactly who's doing the calcium magnesium isotopes, but I know that somebody is doing calcium magnesium isotopes for that interval. And so that's work in progress. I'm, I'm sure that, that yeah, something will come out of that. Doing that. Yeah, they could do that yeah. in Princeton. And yeah. I agree with you completely that it's it, you, one needs to be very careful about finding reasons to dismiss awkward data. Yeah, yeah. But no, totally, totally it's possible. I, but I would say actually, and I would um, say again, actually, that um, if that is true, then that correlation for the base uh, results in the in more overlap with the assemblages. Yeah. If we're if we're actually correlating these. Yeah, yeah. you still have the Claudine, it's up, you know, sure. by yeah. 37. So yeah. And yeah. Last appearances. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good work, Fred. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Anybody have any uh, last points they want to bring up, discuss? Fred, you can also cut it if we're running too long. Oh, no, it's fine. No, I'm happy to keep talking. OK, I'll leave a few seconds. Uh, how, how healthy is boat work in Siberia? Sorry, say that again? How healthy is boat work in Siberia? Oh, you'd have to ask Andre, Rachel, and Marianne. I wish that I'd gone along with them um, uh, to, to, to that field excursion. I would love to go down to those sections in Siberia, especially some of the there are some other in really interesting ones for the Lower Cambrian. I mean, Mount Conus is one that I'd love to go and visit because the the records from there are really intriguing, but they're only partial. And so we we really want more carbon isotope data from that area to try and to hopefully help with the correlation. But yeah, I, I would love to do some field work in Siberia, but I don't see it happening anytime soon, unfortunately. Okay, since it became chat hour, I'll I'll call that the end. Um, all right. Thanks a bunch, Fred, and thanks for every, everybody who was yeah. here. Good discussion, good talk, and all. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Take care, everybody.